So I got Winston from a rescue centre when he was a little over one year old. I think he was about 14 months. Now, I didn't get any breed papers or anything with him, but pretty sure that he is a working Cocker Spaniel. Now, as a working breed, he has a lot of energy. He is bred to go all day, and he will indeed go all day, and he gives the Duracell Bunny a run for its money. So then fast forward to April 2019, he was then seven years old and I took him out on a morning for his usual morning walk and he was doing just that, he was walking, which for a spaniel, especially a working breed spaniel, that is very unusual. Usually when we go out on our walks, he's in front and I spend most of my time just staring at his backside as he weaves across the path, runs in bushes, etc. But on this morning, he was behind me, he was walking and I was too quick for him. I had to keep telling him to come on, hurry up, let's keep going. And it was just as though he, he couldn't move any quicker. So I took him back to the house and I thought it was very strange. So I took him to the vets. But it was kind of like the most awkward vet appointment ever because there was no reason for him to just be walking and when i went into the veterinary appointment they were like what's wrong and i'm like he's walking and they're like and then i'm like yeah he he doesn't walk that's that's very unusual for him to do that now for those that are watching my vlogs you'll even notice that he sprained his front leg not long ago and he's 12 years old he had a sprained front leg but he's still wagging his tail and he's still walking in front of me and I don't need to hurry him along. So the fact that he was then seven years old in his prime and was walking behind me and struggling to keep up with me was, there was obviously something wrong but the, the vet didn't quite know what to do about it. He was walking fine, it wasn't as though he looked lame. Um, I think they did his bloods that time. I know they did his bloods at some point and they came back normal. The only thing the vet really picked up on was that his temperature was a little high and that his gums were a little pale. So I think because she didn't quite know what else to do, she was like, oh, maybe he's got an infection and give him a shot of antibiotics. And we're just like, we'll see how he is in a few days. Now, I didn't think that was it because, like I said, it would take a lot for my dog just to be walking. Like I said, you could probably chop his leg off and he would still try and walk in front. But there was nothing else to really go on. So I took him home and he did brighten up a little bit. So I think the following morning when we went out for a walk, he kind of did have a little bit more energy about him. We only went out for like a little short walk, mainly just for him to go to the toilet and have a little sniff. But then as I went back into the house, I was opening the, the back door and I noticed he, he wasn't there. He would basically stopped just shy of the driveway. And he had just sat there and I was shouting him and he was very hunched and he just didn't come. And he looked like he couldn't, like his face was he, he knew he had to come, but he just couldn't. It was, it was a really strange look on his face. So I went and picked him up, which he doesn't like being picked up anyway. It's one thing that he's never liked since I got him as a rescue dog. He hates being picked up or manhandled in any way. But I managed to pick him up and I took him into the kitchen and I put him on the kitchen floor. 
and I went and got one of his favourite treats, which was a dried bit of shredded duck. And I was holding it a few metres away from him, saying, come on, come and get it. And I could see him trying to, to stand up off his back legs to come and get it, but he just physically couldn't. So I went and gave him the duck, and I just sat with him for a little bit. And I remember as a child, we had an Alsatian as a kid, and I remember um, there was a day where his back end just went, and he couldn't move with his back legs. And then that was the day that he had to be put to sleep. So I thought, that's what's just happened to Winston. I th I, at the time I said, oh, I thought it was just an Alsatian thing, but it was very similar to what I was seeing in Winston. And I sat with him for a bit and I, I thought, I thought I'll be ringing the vets in a second and I'm probably gonna take him to the vets and they're probably gonna advise for him to be put to sleep. So I just sat with him, give him a little cuddle and I just sat on the floor for a few moments just before I rang the vets. And then after a few minutes, he got up, he wandered through the kitchen, got his toy and just came wiggling back to me. And I just sat there just going, you couldn't move a minute ago. Why, where has this came from? But then as I was watching him move, he wasn't moving the same. So his back legs looked very weak and they were kind of plaiting over each other. He was very kind of unsteady on them. He had a very narrow base with them. Now, luckily I'd videoed this. So I was kind of doing it as proof for the vets to kind of say, this is what I've seen. And I took him down again. Now, luckily I got to see the same lady and I was like, okay, look, you're gonna think I'm mental because he's now walking around, which appears to be fine. I said, but a couple of hours ago, he couldn't move. And I showed her the videos and she looked at them and then she was watching him move and she was like, yeah, and she saw the plaiting of the back legs as well. So I was like, right. So at least we had something then to kind of go off rather than my dog's just walking. So then she referred us to the University of Liverpool. Um, so they have a small animal practice up there and basically referred us for an MRI and we went the same day. So I took Winston to the vets, I think probably about, so he, he stopped moving um, or stopped being able to walk around about, I think it was like 10 o'clock. I had the veterinary appointment at 12 o'clock and I was in Liverpool at three o'clock in the afternoon on the same day for an MRI. So while Winston was coming around from the anaesthetic, I got to go and talk to the vet and look at the results of the MRI. Now, from what I remember, the way it was explained to me was Winston had degenerative disc disease. And I was panicking, thinking, well, is this something I've done? Have I not fed him properly? Was this something missing from his diet, his lifestyle, his exercise? But apparently it's just something that's common in the breed and it caused a section of his spine to be quite weak and to try and strengthen itself the spine started growing more bone around a certain section that then pressed on the spinal cord and it prevented the messages from his brain going down to his back legs so in order to correct this he would need an operation to remove the pressure and to stabilize his spine. So here's the image from the MRI. So where the white circle is, you'll see that that bone is just bigger than the rest of them and it's pressing on the spinal cord which is sitting above it and you can see the compression. So the vet's plan was to file down that big bone to remove the compression from the spinal cord and then to put implants in his spine to stabilize it and therefore prevent the issue from reoccurring. Now, if you want a more scientific description, his paperwork said that he was having an L1 and L2 right-sided hemilaminectomy and spinal stabilization. Now, that hemilaminectomy word means a surgical procedure that aims to enlarge the space in the spinal canal to reduce nerve compression or pressure. And this is done by removing part of a vertebrae called lamina that has been damaged or is damaging surrounding structures. 
So this was a big operation and there was a lot to consider. So the MRI had cost £1,300. The operation itself was going to cost a little over £5,000. And then there was the rehab as well. We also had to bear in mind that with every operation, there is a risk. He, he might not come around off the operating table. It was a big operation that there's a lot of stuff that can go wrong. There was also the risk that the operation might go successful and he might recover, but the messages may not go down to his back legs again. So there was a chance that he could still be kind of paralyzed from his waist down. Now, for me personally, I know a lot of people are happy to put their dogs in carts and, and that's great. But for me personally, I think Winston wouldn't mentally be able to deal with that. He lives running around and going through bushes and just being a dog. And I think having the restriction of a car, I don't think would be a good quality of life for him. So if his movement in his back legs didn't come back, I would have opted to put him to sleep. That would have been my personal choice for my dog. So there was also that chance that we could go through all the stress and cost of the operation and still have to put him to sleep. So there was an awful lot to think about. And I know this sounds heartless, but there was a part of me that thought, if I took away the emotion and the uniqueness that is Winston, and say I looked at it like a car, it would just be wrote off because it would cost far too much to repair. It'd be cheaper to buy a new one. I know that sounds really heartless, but that kind of goes through your head because you could buy a new dog, <laughs> You know what I mean? For a thousand. Winston only cost £175 from the rescue centre. So you could buy a new dog for a thousand and not have any of these issues and not have to go through the rehab, the back and forward vet appointments, the medication and, and miss all that. But of course, Winston isn't a material object. And he's not just a dog. He's my little friend. So yes, I could get another working Cocker Spaniel but I couldn't get another Winston. So we set a date for the operation. So a week later, drove him back to Liverpool to check him in the night before his operation. So had to sign all the risk forms, give over all my insurance details, etc. And then I came back with just a collar and a lead, thinking that that might be the last time I saw him because it was now in the hands of the vets and the gods to some extent. Like, was he going to make it through this operation? Was he going to be okay? And then the next day was possibly one of the longest days of my life where I was waiting by the phone from a call from the vets. Now, they phoned me and they said that the operation was done. It lasted about four hours. It didn't go completely to plan. And drilling through his spine took more than they thought. Um, and Winston ended up losing a lot of blood through the operation. So he was then transferred to the ICU and they were on standby to give him a blood transfusion. Now, thankfully, they didn't need to do that and Winston recovered on his own from the, the high amount of blood loss. But he wasn't out of the woods yet. He still needed to get his back legs moving again. Now, we also had to stay at the veterinary hospital for a week so that they could administer pain meds. Obviously, they can give him much stronger stuff than I would be able to give him at home. He was also then able to see the physiotherapist regularly and she was therefore responsible to try and get the movement again back in his legs. I'm happy to say that she was successful and Winston was walking again. And then after a few days, they phoned me up and said I could come and collect him and take him home. Now, although it was great to be able to bring him home, that wasn't the end of it. He had a very wrong rehab process. So first of all, he had to have his movement 
restricted. He obviously couldn't go jumping on sofas, running up the stairs, playing any of that stuff. So I got him a metal pen um, that you could kind of move and create different shapes with. So at first we had it in its smallest kind of shape, which was a circle. And he stayed in there, came out only to go to the toilet and then went back in again. So I just want to show you where Winston lived for several months. So this is the metal pen that we got him and as you can see it's in the smallest shape which is a circle and this is where he spent most of his time when he came out of hospital. Now as he started to get better I could start to open up the pen a little bit. So by using the back wall as an extra barrier we could create different shapes and as he got even better we could even open up the patio doors and allow him to go and wander around outside. I would often catch him just stood and sniffing the air as though he was missing the great outdoors. But now let's just fast forward back a bit to the day that we brought him home. I then had a list of God knows how much medication. I remember the vet going through it with me and I'm like, yeah, yeah. And he's like, God, I've this at this time, this at this time, this at this time. And it was in the end, he ran it all down for me. And I just had to set alarms on my phone for when each one was due because otherwise I would have completely lost track. Now, luckily I work from home and my work is very flexible because I work for myself. But if anybody had kids or a full-time job or even a part-time job, I think they would struggle because it is literally almost round the clock care of toilet, medication, toilet, medication, 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 toilet. I had alarms going off in the middle of the night. I had to get out of bed to give him medication. It was intense. We also had more vet appointments to attend. So one was where he had to have his staples removed and his wound checked. Luckily, we could do that at our local vets. But another one where we had to go all the way back to Liverpool again was when they had to re-x-ray him. So they were basically checking to see that the implants had stayed where they put them. And it was kind of like the last check in the box. So we had to drive all the way back up to Liverpool. He had to be knocked out once again, have x-rays at all different angles of his spine, and then review them to really say, has this been a success? Have they stayed? Do we need to open him back up again? I don't know whether I would let him go through it again, but that was obviously a bridge that we might have had to cross. But thankfully, the x-rays came back fine. And then came the hydrotherapy. So to start off with, they kept Winston in a straight line rather than having him swim around in circles. So she would take him backwards off the ledge, allow him to swim a little bit, and then take him back to the ledge again. Now, in the beginning, he probably spent more time on the ledge than he actually did swimming, simply because his fitness was very poor and obviously he was just recovering from a major operation. Now, he would swim for a little bit longer each time and the hydrotherapist also started to influence his left hind leg because this was the one that he was having trouble with, kind of getting back into motion again and coordinating. He then progressed to doing controlled laps of the pool. Again, all the time trying to influence that left leg to keep kicking. Now for extra motivation, there was a time when I had to get in the pool with him to give him something to swim towards. He then progressed to using toys and again doing laps of the pool, but always with the help of the hydrotherapist until eventually he was doing it on his own and the hydrotherapist was just there to throw the toy and Winston would happily swim around in the pool all day long. This quickly became one of his favorite things to do. In total, I would say that the operation and his full rehab and for him going back to normal was about a year. And what people don't talk about is they talk about obviously you've got the four hour operation. Well, that's great, but then obviously you've got the rehab. But it's also, it takes such an emotional toll. Um, if Winston's in his pen and I'd be sat working 
if he moved too quickly or made a noise or just something wasn't quite right you'd be like oh my god is something wrong has he just done something did he get up too quick like what was that noise is he in pain it, it was such an emotional toll all the time like i rang the vets a lot saying is this normal is this normal this has happened one thing that did happen he's got a seroma on his back so where fluid started to fill because there was a space where they'd been operating fluid started filling up the space and created this like a uh, big like water bed on his back and I was, I was like is this okay is this okay and they were like yeah it's just a serum it'll go down the body will absorb it etc but everything was just panic you were on a complete edge all the time and then when you start taking your dog out for walks again you know what I mean? You're completely panicking if any other dog runs over or jumps on him or jumps on his back or, you know, gets him excited, any of that stuff. So I was trying to go out at very quiet times of the day so I know that we would just be left in peace. Um, especially when he's first started to grow back, he looked just like a normal dog. So it was, it was very easy for people just to think that they could come over and play with him and they couldn't. So was the operation worth it and would I do it again? Now it's really easy now in hindsight because the operation was done when Winston was seven. He's now 12. So I've had an extra five years with my best friend. Now all in all with the MRI, the operation, the x-rays, extra vet appointments, hydrotherapy, the whole cost probably came close to 7,000 pounds. Now, if someone said to you, pay me £7,000 and I'll give you an extra five years with your best friend, your dog, your sister, a loved one, you'd probably take that deal. I think that was a good return on investment. So, yes, I think it was worth doing. However, if he... Because he's got degenerative disc disease, there's always a chance that something else could happen in his spine. Now, because he's 12 years old now, I wouldn't put him through it again because he's just too old to go through the stress and the pressure of the operation and then the rehab. It would be too much at this stage in his life. But at seven, in the prime of his life, um, I think it was worth it. Now, as I said, it did cost close to 7,000 pounds and he was insured. Um, but only insured up to £3,000 because I naively thought that he wouldn't do anything else that would cost more than £3,000. I was like, if he breaks a leg, what's that going to be? A couple of grand? That'd be fine. But yeah, this was a lot more than £3,000. So the insurance paid that and then we paid the other £4,000. Which makes it an even better deal. I got five years for £4,000. Now, funnily enough, the reason why you can watch YouTube videos of Winston and I going on adventures is partly down to this operation. Because before the operation, although we still went out and did stuff, I always thought there was time to do all the other stuff. Does that make sense? Like, there was time to go here and go there and do that. So it was never really a priority. We'd always do it later. And then when this operation happened, it was kind of a wake-up call because, do you know what I mean, maybe that clock could have run out on that day. So after the operation, I appreciated it more and I decided to make the most of it and to make as many memories with him as possible. And that's when the adventures really started. And I would have to say I've got more memories of him post-op than I have pre-op, simply because we've just done so much since. So in a way, it was kind of a blessing in disguise. It stopped me from taking him for granted and thinking that we'll always have time together because one of the saddest things about dogs is that they just don't live long enough. They're not always going to be there. And now I just try to make as many memories with Winston as possible. Whether that's hiking up a mountain or just sitting, reading a book or watching a movie together. But thank you very much for watching my video. We'll hope to see you on the next adventure very soon.